Uh, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Lana Berezovska and uh, I continue to do my podcast with the most uh, amazing, unique people in the world. And of course, all my guests are very unique. And today I would like to present you uh, also uh, the person I met recently, but actually that amazed me with uh, um, the more I know about the, him, the, the, the more I was amazed. So my actual guest is uh, Dr. Eric Steinberg from uh, Switzerland, also from United States. And I will tell you a few words about him, but hi, hi, Eric. Nice to Hello meet you. There. And uh, I appreciate, I really thank you for joining me in this podcast. And I'm going to tell you a few words about Eric, but more information you will have in information uh, about this video. So you just scroll down and you'll see more information about, about Dr. Uh, Steinbock. So I'm actually have to read because I don't want to miss any important um, information about this wonderful speaker. So Dr. Steinbock actually uh, has extensive career in the hospitality industry, but also he's actually uh, has education in psychology uh, and he has PhD um, uh, on psychological topic. And I'm gonna tell you more, just one second. Okay, so he's a distinguished professor at the Swiss Hotel Management School in Leisin, Switzerland. And he continues his uh, consulting practice uh, in hospitality industry. He uh, actually served as the regional vice president and managing director at uh, Rosewood Hotels and Resorts in Saudi Arabia. And also as an area managing director as Carline Hotel in New York City. Uh, he also uh, spent his career mostly at the Reeds Carlton Hotel Company, including the position of general manager and also as a global vice president of food and beverage. And as I mentioned, he wrote, uh, he actually studied and uh, completed his PhD study at Iowa State University. And his work was named Emotional Intelligence uh, Competencies for Success in Early Hospitality Career. What I want to say, I like travel, you know, and I usually like when I, I spend my time when I'm traveling hotels. And for me, it's very important uh, to feel comfortable, like at home. And that's what you're doing. Uh, it's actually about building relationship with customers and uh, people who work in hotel and making our life comfort comfortable. And I never met any other person who would pay so much attention on emotional intelligence and um, teaching the staff to be friendly, to be caring, uh, to actually care about us customers of hotels. And, and, and thank you very much for what you're doing. So I'm giving you a word. Sorry, I'm talking a lot, but it's just the beginning, but I want to hear from you. And we choose this, I would say, uh, com not complicated, but not simple uh, topic of our conversation. It's about um, emotional intelligence and also well-being. And I'm sure many people are confused how to interpret this, what is the meaning of emotional intelligence and actually what is the meaning of well-being. And uh, if you can tell me more about emotional intelligence, because I know I'm sure many people have no idea what it is and think it's about your, I don't know, some high kind of level of brain, like, you know, but I would like you to explain more to people what is actually emotional intelligence. Well, thank you, Lena. I'm very honored that uh, I am on your broadcast um, to, to answer your question, what is emotional intelligence? There has been uh, many different descriptions in a simple way by some of the gurus of, the, of that science is to be able to assess and manage one's own and, and other people's emotional uh, state or emotions, if you will. Uh, and we, I, have, I use a tool uh, that was developed by a company called Six Seconds, where we measure or we assess our participants' emotional intelligence competencies, which we have broken down into eight competencies. And I briefly explain, it is emotional literacy, meaning, meaning uh, how well can I define 
my emotions, recognizing bad patterns. How do I react to my emotions? Do I do things automatically or do I actually think about it? Apply consequential thinking, which how much do I think ahead of time, the costs and benefits, the pros and cons of mm -hmm. my that have been motivated by the emotions. Uh, engage in intrinsic motivation, which means how much do I do things out from the heart and not because of some extrinsic uh, motivators. Uh, how well do I manage my emotions? How well can I actually get out of a uh, emotion that doesn't serve me well? Can I see sunshine when it's raining? Uh, uh, positive thinking, uh, how well do I assess ahead of time if the glass is half full and is there opportunities to fill it up? And then the last two are uh, empathy, which of course many people call uh, seem to uh, affiliate with emotional intelligence very a lot. And pursue noble goals is do I know where my life is heading to and why I'm doing the things I'm doing. So we assess these eight competencies. They are self-assessments, and with them they have um, also four success factors, which is effectiveness, quality of life, relationships, and well-being. And well-being is, of course, physical well-being, but also the, the emotional well-being of a person. Uh, then we, in my studies, I did linear regression analysis with uh, 380 subjects, uh, seeing which emotional intelligence competences affect those outcome factors the most. And we found that in the early stages, intrinsic motivation is uh, the competency that has basically statistically the only significant effect on the on all four outcomes and that was the in gist of my my research work but then what happened covid came around mm -hmm. and because i had a lot of data at school already because we i've been assessing students hundreds of students with this uh with this tool I had a lot of, uh, obviously, a lot of data already from students before COVID, and I compared that uh, data with the students during COVID. Now, students during COVID, sometimes they had to stay in their rooms, they were quarantined, they didn't know what they're going to do after they graduate, um, they didn't have those relationships uh, that they usually have at the university, and I expected that the average score for the sense of well-being, the subjective sense of well-being, how they feel about it, would change significantly. Well, it was a big surprise to me that the sense of well-being of the students during COVID and before COVID didn't change at all. The bell curve, the bell curve changed. So people who tended to be a little unhappy before would be the ones that became very unhappy. And the people that were somewhat happy before became very happy. Uh, they experienced postpartum growth. And because they had less choice of things to do, life actually became easier for them. And so then I, uh, with that, with that armed with that data, I decided I'm gonna focus more on the science of well-being. And we now run experiments with interventions with our students to see what works for our students. We don't have any outcomes yet, so please don't ask me what we're gonna do, what we're okay. doing because we, <laughs> okay. we're in the middle of it at this point. Um, so that's uh, in, a, in a nutshell, what I've been doing uh, with emotional intelligence and the science of well-being. Very interesting. And actually, when we are talking about well-being, again, there's a lot of definitional well-being. And uh, that's why you put um, the word subjective well-being, because every subject, every person uh, look at well-being in own way. And um, honestly speaking, I see how I actually change even here and how my friends and colleagues change and how they started to perceive life in a different way and still be happy, still do something. And um, even this war in Ukraine that started a year ago, and they actually a little more. And I'm Ukrainian, and I'm going through emotional like stress. But I found that even in the, under the circumstances of war, people try to survive and do something better and create something better and talk about well-being, like emotional, psychological well-being. So 
so well being it's not a uh, stable condition all the time and, and definition uh, subjective it means every person can change um uh, this uh, perception of well-being and minimize let's say like it's interesting how it changed because we start looking we about something very important for us during this two years of quarantine and we had very strict quarantine here in Canada and I found that we uh, minimize uh the things we need the like you know we start thinking differently appreciating every day and everything that surrounds us and also we didn't complain that it became worse in a way that um we become mental and stable even we have like you know data that a lot of young the young people young generation had more psychological problem mental problem than us uh, like older generation what actually used from intelligent intelligence um sorry from emotional intelligence in uh, uh teaching your students like uh, because it's more like psychological part and they know it's very important like to have good relationship with customers and not only with customers but everyone who who uh, surrounds this the person doesn't matter what profession uh have changed actually the training and how much of psychological part like you put in your training uh, uh in the hospitality industry yeah the, if there is an industry that has much to do with the relationships is the hospitality industry exactly. that's uh that's where it's really built on and one can actually measure how well guests feel about themselves staying at a hotel or eating in a dining room by how well the employees get along with each other. If, there's, if there are great relationships within employees, one tends to feel pretty good about being in the place. So the subjective well-being is contagious, if you will. Um, and it goes the other way too. Uh, if they don't get along with each other, I don't want to stay there. <laughs> so we so we use relationship building exercises quite a bit. Uh, they are different uh, from country to country. There are social skills that one has to consider. Uh, we At our school, we have students from all over the world. 60% of our students are actually from the Republic of China. Uh, another wow. 20% for the rest of Asia. And then the rest is just spread from all over the world, Africa and Europe and Middle East and so on. So, uh, so we have to be actually careful, even when we speak, we teach in English, that the translations about relationship building doesn't get lost and the translation about well-being doesn't get lost because there are some words that just don't translate for example in german have being happy is ich bin glücklich but it also means i'm lucky mm -hmm. uh, it's interchangeable between lucky and happy uh, so if we if i talk too much about happiness they think it's all about luck if I'm not careful. And a really interesting uh, situation I just experienced last week, I was still in Switzerland teaching. I was talking uh, with, we were talking about entitlement. And there are some articles, some very good articles written on when people have a sense of entitlement that could actually cause stress. Now they define entitlement in these articles as two types of entitlement, one psychological entitlement and the other one, legitimate entitlement. Legitimate entitlement is I have done something, I've worked really hard all my life, I saved my money, I am now going on a world cruise. I'm entitled to that. Uh, psychological entitlement is I haven't done anything, but the world owes me something. <laughs> it's, and, true. it's true. And, Sometimes, like, I mean, before I had the same thoughts like when I was disappointed in achievements or when I didn't get uh, in career or, or other like you know directions what I wanted and then I was like asking myself who's guilty <laughs> I mean the world actually owes me something the universe owes me something the God owes me something so I agree with you we all go into this but sometimes it's, people stuck in this stuff yeah yeah and the psychological entitlement actually causes stress Mm -hmm. uh, it, it actually causes a, de de uh, a uh, uh, lesser happiness, lesser sense of well-being. So I was explaining that to the students, and the Chinese students looked at me. They couldn't understand the world entitlement. 
Mm-hmm. So they, I asked them to look, Google search it and look it up. And then they realized that their, their idea of earned and unearned entitlement were come two completely different expressions. So if I just say entitlement, they wouldn't even know what I was talking about. Um, and, and that goes on in other languages and so on. So when we talk about subjective sense of well-being, we also and also emotions uh, are expressed differently in different cultures. Uh, I come from a culture in Austria where we don't tell everybody we love them all the time. We just don't do it until we, until it's really, really serious. If I was married to an Austrian woman and I would tell her six times a day that I love her, she would probably ask me to see a psychologist, go to therapy. Uh, while in America, I love you, love you, love you, gets thrown around like candy. Yeah, honey, love you. Yeah, I know. Or the, or the idea, I miss you. Well, in German, if I say I miss you, that means I'm going to notify the police because there's something seriously wrong. Uh, but the idea of the emotion of missing somebody uh, is just not expressed the same way. So what I'm trying to say is with dealing with, with an international student body and as the, the global world it becomes a village, we have to be cognizant of the different cultures and interpretations of both emotional intelligence and subjective well-being. Wow, it's interesting. Actually, when you were telling me about this, uh, I love you, like when, when they, in the United States or actually North America. And I uh, remember uh, like funny jokes. So uh, when uh, uh, a group of friends came to one guy and they had some kind of party and it's like old, old people. And um, actually they saw like whenever guys said, honey, bring us beer, honey, bring us that, like sweetie, whatever. So. And they saw like beautiful relationship and they asked him, how can you manage such a wonderful relation with your wife, calling her honey, calling her sweet. And she always like responding in a nice way. And he said, you know, we lived together for so long that I forgot her name. (laughs) 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 And he he chose like, you know, (laughs) different words, beautiful (laughs) words just to call it. (laughs) <laughs> and about translation, you know, I totally agree with you because, for example, uh, there are like a couple words that you cannot translate even in Slavic languages like Ukrainian, Russian, like resilience. There's no translation that would really express what does it mean. And even the word well being, it's like difficult to translate in Slavic languages. And I know many people speak English and it could be very good English, advanced English, like, you know, but at the same time, when it comes to some definition or specific specific word in specific areas, yeah, you're right. So, uh, and plus cultures, you know, yeah, and people have an absolutely different opinion or wrong translation or understanding. And what you're doing when you said that, uh, I like it when you said in different countries, so you actually try to uh, be adjusted to their culture, then like, you know, understanding even their philosophy, their mentality. And it's really great because it's actually made entire world comfortable. When we go there, you know, it's for us more comfortable to talk to people who understand what we're talking about and be in hotels or anywhere else in restaurants and feel comfortable and happy, enjoying food, enjoying staying, enjoying travels. So yeah, you really, really, uh, do do uh, a great job in this direction. As I t- as I mentioned before, I never met uh, a person who was putting so much uh, psychological um, topics into um, hospitality industry. It never was before, right? And then you change perception, and um, I'm happy that you have people who understood and probably understand you now. And by the way, is what di- it, it was it difficult to. Uh, start uh, consulting on these topics, like, you know, and start lecturing these topics in hospitality industry? Well, because I've had a career and I have colleagues, former colleagues that are still in the the industry, Mm -hmm. uh, I have connections where I can go in and talk with the leaders and managers in, in some of the hotels and in some of the organizations it makes it easier. And I usually mention my sessions as leadership sessions, because I don't think if I mentioned just emotional intelligence sessions or well-being sessions, they would be received the same way. 
Unfortunately, mm-hmm. we have uh, we've become uh, leadership addicted. Uh, that word to that word, addicted to that word. Crazy enough, we need more followers than leaders, and we have very little followership education, which I also incorporate. But when I do my seminars and my workshops and at school, my goal is for the participants to get to know themselves a little bit better. And and if because if somebody knows themselves better, then they can, then they have a better impact typically on the people around them. Which makes them better leader, better leaders, and better followers, which are not mutually exclusive. Not everyone could be a leader. And wait a minute, I'm the leader. I'm the one that says when we go. Here we go. Well, mostly, um, yeah, we need more followers because if we are leaders, we have to share with people. And not everyone could be a leader. But at the same time, if the leader supports you and you have a core who supports you, it's very important, yeah. Because uh, I was uh, taking this uh, science character test from like University of Pennsylvania when I was taking my courses in psychology. And you know, it's interesting that I knew who I am and uh, I, I knew my strengths, but when I took a test, number one, the dominant is leadership, wow. <laughs> you know, I knew I'm a leader, but you know, uh, but why actually I was surprised because I had from many people especially who enemies who actually try to diminish me like become my enemies I don't like this word I don't have enemies but they try to be my enemies they always are telling me you know to be a leader it's not good because you're not like everyone you have to be like when you talk you like you know and that's why I had question even regarding my strengths I said maybe I'm wrong maybe I shouldn't show that I'm a leader and also another strength is forgiveness and mercy the second one and people say, oh, you're too soft. You forgive everyone. You give everyone a second chance, a third chance. Why? It's like you're soft. It's not your strengths. It's like... And then the test showed me that, yeah, it's my positive strengths. It's not too many people can forgive. The another one, it's social intelligence. Like you have emotional intelligence, like social intelligence, my strengths, the, the very high level strengths. And it says, I love people, I love uh, society, I like to help people, you know, and and it's it's another another part. That's why, yeah, it's very important to people know who they are. And um, also regarding emotion, like um, coming back a little bit to emotional intelligence, why is it wasn't accepted? I think because this the word intelligence is uh, a little bit tricky because people think it's only for well-educated people. And uh, I know what I uh, what I feel, what I express. So maybe I don't need any training in intelligence, like to be intelligent as emotionally, right? And also the people uh, do not understand it's not just emotion; it's actually perception of you through the and, and showing the feelings, showing emotion. It's actually motivation, right? And it's dealing with stress, dealing with uh, some problems you're facing. So it's really worse to, to read, but uh, to, 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 to be trained. But uh, some people, when they look at this IQ, I don't like IQs. I think it's not for me, but mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't like any test like that because I cannot express myself. I mean, I know it has some meaning. It's important in some like, you know, direction. I never took IQ test, <laughs> not because I'm afraid to fail and have a low level. I know who I am, but it's not a different one. I just don't like any tests and exams. But um, when I started reading about emotional intelligence, I realized why people try to kind of, okay, it's not for me, uh, because uh, usually they call it uh, emo, uh, EQ test or I uh, or EI test. And if, oh, again, I need to go through this validation of myself and who I am. And uh, it's it's wonderful that there are people like you who says, no, it's nothing, nothing scary. It's actually all about you. It's about your emotions. It's about other wonderful things of your personality. You just need to know who we are and continue to improve in a direction you want to improve. And people say industry, any industry, it's all about money. It's about business. It's not about people. And then you say, no, no, it's about people. Uh, that's why I'm teaching. It's, uh, like, it's, it's, it's amazing. So we come into the end of our um, podcast. Uh, and uh, what would you like to tell people about this um, emotional intelligence and well-being? Like summarize uh, what they should take from our podcast or from a conversation. 
No, oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a real pleasure spending some time with you. You talked about IQ, and although I have no data on that, I doubt very much that there's a correlation of IQ and well-being. I think people with low IQ could be just as happy as people yeah. with high IQ can be miserable. Um, there is not as much of a correlation of emotional intelligence and well-being either. However, there is a strong correlation. There's plenty of data on that, on emotional intelligence and relationships. And relationships, if we look at Seligman's PERMA model, uh, relationship plays a huge part in well-being. And some say it's the most important part. Others argue that, but it most certainly is part of subjective well-being and how good are my relationships. And emotional intelligence does help building solid, deep relationships. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much for coming to my podcast. And, and, and we, I think we had very interesting conversation and I'm sure we'll have more uh, meetings like that and discussing many, many other subjects and topics, you know, and uh, really thank you very much, especially knowing that you in a hurry, you're leaving uh, for United States in a couple of days. Yes, and, yes, and I caught you right, like you know, on time. Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, I'm still in Europe now. Yep. Yeah, and that's in the. Thank you very much, Alina. Thank you very much. It's such a pleasure. Hope to see you again sometimes. Okay. Bye bye. You know, wow. Uh, I'm excited about your personality, you are, Eric. You like, you know, amazing. Uh, oh, thank you, Alina. That's so nice of you. You're such a great uh, television personality. I know I no, was on television, I was on radio actually, yeah. I mean, I'm not afraid oh. of people. For many years, uh, I was interviewing people I like, people I admire, to show uh, other people, look, uh, this is a unique person, this is an amazing person, this is a positive person, and you should to learn something from this person. Lena, I, mean, I have to congratulate you of the interest that you have uh, created with your post in the in the uh, Positive Psychology Association newsletters. It seems like a lot of people are interested in contributing. Uh, yeah, actually, the next two weeks are full with the records. So I have fantastic. sometimes two, three records. I'm amazed. I'm amazed because, you know, I, I wasn't expecting such a wonderful reply. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you, every person who wrote me, it's different, completely different and interesting wonderful. topics. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have many different like topics and wonderful you no know, maybe it would be my motivation to go back uh and improve my german because i was fluent in german before i became fluent in english <laughs> but it was 40 years ago when one forgets, I, one forgets I know it's somewhere in the memory because when i watch uh, german movies i can understand a lot but i'm not so fluent and i can read but i'm not so fluent in answering like before uh, but it's still somewhere in my brain, in the memory part. Wonderful. But wonderful. Lina, thank I'll you so you. much. That was okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. I'll see you when I see you, but definitely I'll see you. <laughs> I look forward to it. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.